honestly couldn't say what inspired me to bikepack the Pony Express Trail. One evening, I stumbled across an item reporting that a cyclist had mapped a largely off-road bikepacking route that followed the trail as closely as possible. I knew right then I had to ride it. What I didn't know was why. I used to ride ultra-distance cycling events, but that had been more than a decade earlier. Those rides were on paved roads on a lightweight, skinny-tired bike. For the past few years, I'd only ridden a mountain bike on fun, short, low-speed trails. Bikepacking was the worst combination of both. Long days riding everything from busy highway shoulders to sketchy trails through remote terrain, carrying with me everything I'd need to survive, and doing it all on a slow bike loaded down with gear. And by the time I rode, I'd be 62 years old, not the ideal age to start a five-week solo ride across some of the most remote areas of the American West. And yet, there it was. Someone had laid out a Pony Express bikepacking route, and I knew I had to ride it or regret missing the opportunity for the rest of my life, even if it killed me. A key component of a long-distance ride is, of course, the bike. The only bike I had that might work was my Ibis Ripley, which is a full-suspension mountain bike. Most bike packers ride gravel grinders or cross bikes, beefed-up road bikes designed to handle rougher roads on wider tires. Some have suspension forks, but all are hardtail, rigid frames without rear suspension. Gravel and cross bikes are lighter and faster than mountain bikes, and because they have a standard frame, you could pack all the camping gear you need on the bike itself. There aren't many places to mount bags on a bike like the Ripley. I thought about buying a gravel grinder just for this ride, but in the end, I decided that rather than spending thousands of dollars on a new bike, I'd be better off spending hundreds on an off-road trailer instead. I would be riding a heavier rig, but packing would be a lot easier. And let's face it, if you're in a hurry to see the Pony Express Trail, a bicycle should probably not be your transportation mode of choice. For training, I attached the trailer to the bike, threw a 40-pound sandbag in back, and started putting in miles. I live in Davis, California, which is smack in the middle of the Central Valley. We're at 50 feet of elevation. The only hills for 50 miles in any direction are freeway overpasses. At first, I drove to the hills. As my mileage increased, I was able to ride to and from them and actually get some decent climbing in. As time passed, I made adjustments to convert my bike from a gonzo rock crawling machine into a more appropriate long distance rig. I beefed up the disc brakes to handle the heavier loads and lowered the gearing so I could hump those loads over 7,000 foot passes. I switched out the functional sticky hand grips for ergonomic pads. I added a handlebar mount for an iPhone, which I'd used to navigate. I attached a rear mount for a radar to warn me of passing cars when I had to ride highways and replaced the cheap spring suspension in the expensive trailer for a far more functional air shock. Most importantly, I switched out the lightweight saddle I'd been using for a leather Brooks saddle. Brooks started out making horse saddles in the 1860s and has been making bike saddles since the 1870s. The bicycle itself was initially conceived as a mechanical horse, which is how I came to experience the Pony Express Trail on a different type of saddle and a different type of horse, I guess, none of which has anything to do with why I chose to ride a Brooks. In my experience, most ultra-distance riders opt for a saddle like a Brooks, that is, leather stretched over a frame, no extra padding beyond the give of the leather. It seems counterintuitive, but it works, after a fashion, but more about that later. I knew from the start that just riding the Pony Express Trail wouldn't be enough. There were nearly 200 station sites to see along the way, but without any context, they'd just be markers. So I started researching the history along the trail. I soon found that very few of the Pony Express stations had any real significance beyond being a Pony Express station. But the Pony Express Trail followed the major overland trails of the era, the Oregon, California, and Mormon Pioneer Trails, each with a history far deeper and more complex than the story of the Pony Express. I started seeing my trip as a hybrid, On the one hand, I would be traveling at about the same speed as Pony Express riders, 10 to 12 miles per hour on average. At the same time, my setup would be more like an overland emigrant's, most crossed with their worldly belongings packed into a wagon and pulled by oxen. In my case, I'd have all my possible stuff to do a trailer and pulled by a bike, which made me the oxen, I suppose. I came to romanticize the emigrant's journey and started shaping my experience to match theirs. For instance, emigrants had to roast and grind their coffee beans. Being a coffee lover anyway, I picked up a bikepacking coffee mill and coffee maker. Emigrants, and let's be clear, 
when I speak about camp work, I'm really talking about immigrant women. Immigrant women had to cook meals, of course, so I started looking for gourmet bikepacking recipes and buying the cooking gear and accessories I'd need. I even got the idea I could make biscuits in the morning. I think I was channeling Gus McRae from Lonesome Dove. All that went out the window once I started training. As my rides passed the 50-mile mark, I realized I wouldn't have the energy at the end of the day to cook a complicated meal. I ditched the cook kit for a single titanium pot and tossed all the coffee equipment. I shopped for the best instant coffee I could find, along with instant oatmeal. I bought dehydrated meals for dinner, nutrition bars for snacks, peanut butter, Nutella, and tortillas for lunch. The Overland Trail was littered with furniture and even excess food the immigrants discarded along the way. Training rides taught me I had to focus more on what I needed to get me through each day's ride than about what I'd want before or after. Otherwise, I'm sure I'd have tossed a Dutch oven somewhere in the first 100 or so miles. I have a confession to make. I'm not a real bike packer. A died in the wool bike packer has no problem playing things by ear. They'll ride all day and roll out a sleeping bag wherever they end up. They might pitch a tent behind a gas station, for example, or set up a lean-to in a clump of bushes. I took up the activity way too late in life to adopt the whole improvisational camping thing. Every adventure is by definition adventitious, subject to forces beyond our control. But that didn't stop me from trying to plan for every unknowable situation I could imagine. Over the weeks and months, I studied the route, the terrain, the amount of climbing. I tracked wind and weather patterns, temperature swings. I scrutinized the distances between towns, campgrounds, and stores trying to map out as much as possible where I might stay every night and where I might reprovision along the way. I made lists and downloaded maps into two devices in case one gave out. The only variable I could not account for was Wyoming. The trail for 300 miles between Casper and Fort Bridger, Wyoming, had few towns, fewer stores, and no public campgrounds. In other words, the problem with Wyoming was that it was real bikepacking. I'd have to provision for several days' travel, camp wherever I could on federal land, cook every meal, and likely filter my drinking water from the Sweetwater River. I never doubted I could ride the entire distance. One thing ultra-distance teaches you is that long-distance riding is 90% mental. I've ridden 200-mile double centuries, 24-hour rides, and once rode 1,200 kilometers, 750 miles, over three and a half days. So I wasn't worried about the riding, just everything else. In the end, I decided I couldn't decide what to do about Wyoming put my bike on a train and took Amtrak Southwest Chief East to start my ride from St. Joseph, Missouri, not knowing how far I might go.